Joining us now for an exclusive interview is Larry Merlot, CBS president and CEO. Larry, welcome back. Good to have you. Sarah, good, uh, good to be here. Thanks. So I know in part the numbers were helped by insurance profits, fewer people filing claims for elective procedures during COVID-19. Does that just reverse itself now that the country is opening up again? Well, Sarah, we are seeing uh, medical utilization returning to, to normal. We saw you know, uh, a big uptick in, in the month of June, and, and July is appearing to be a normal month. So, you know, we do expect normal type uh, medical utilization, you know, over the second half of the year. And, and, and Sarah, as you mentioned, we, we had a terrific quarter. The real story in the quarter is our strategy coming to life in meaningful ways. We've talked about, you know, ma making care available, meeting people where they are to provide care, whether it's in the community, in the home, uh, or in the palm of your hand. And you know, the pandemic has really accelerated our transformation. And you know, we've got real life examples of you know, care being delivered in community, in home, in the palm of your hand as a result of you know, what we're dealing with with COVID-19. Yeah, we definitely want to talk testing and vaccines and all, and all of that. But just on the results, Larry, Question on prescription drug sales, which were lower on the quarter, and retail sales in the pharmacies. Have those started reversing and picking back up as people are more comfortable going out? Yes, yeah, Sarah, in both cases, uh, you know, as the shelter in place orders were lifted, you know, and we began to return uh, you know, and reopen the economy, you know, we saw traffic pick back up. We saw our front store sales as well as you know, prescription utilization approaching normal levels. Keep in mind, back in March, uh, you know, we did a terrific job in terms of making sure that you know, our, our customers, our patients did not run out of their you know, medications. And we did a lot of refills early. You know, and therefore, there were fewer prescriptions you know, filled within the quarter. But you know, again, we've seen that pick up uh, in the June and July timeframes. Larry, I wanted to ask you what your view was on the, the, the Teladoc uh, Livongo merger and, and whether or not faster growth and consolidation in, in the remote health uh, industry is a good or a bad thing for you. Well, well, there's no question, and it really ties to you know that in the palm of your hand that you know technology will continue to play an important role in you know in healthcare delivery. Uh, you know, we have invested in that with our virtual care properties, and you know as you know, the pandemic was upon us. It, it wasn't a question of, you know, turning that on. It was a question of dialing it up. And, you know, we've seen a dramatic increase in, you know, telemedicine utilization, more than 700% uh, in the second quarter. We also see a real opportunity for uh, utilizing technology for home monitoring. And again, that's something that, that we have invested in. And, you know, you'll see us bringing you know, more capabilities and products to market as we move into the future. So you've got 1,800 test sites for, for COVID-19 testing. And I think you said on the earnings call that, that things have improved as far as people being able to get the tests and get the turnaround times. Are we ready for the fall, though, Larry, as a country where there are warnings that the, the virus could come back from a seasonal perspective with a vengeance? Do we have the testing capability in place in this country? Yeah, Sarah, it's a great question. And first of all, I could not be prouder of the work of our, you know, CBS colleagues in standing up 1,800 testing sites in a matter of weeks. And we've now tested more than, you know, 2 million Americans, you know, through our drive-through sites. And we did see a, a, a spike in activity coming out of the July 4th holiday. We responded immediately in terms of reducing our capacity and more importantly, working with, you know, the labs that process you know, the test results in terms of the work that they were doing to scale up their capacity. But, you know, Sarah, to your point, as a, as a country, we're testing about 17 million Americans a month. You know, the experts say as we move into the fall, you know, we're going to need between 26, 28 million tests on a monthly basis, you know, to meet the demand. And one of the things that we're working on is, you know, creating a plan with which we can pivot to more point of care testing. More of those devices are being approved. And, you know, that's something that we expect to be able to do as we approach the fall time frame to meet that increased demand. What about uh, when it comes to, to a vaccine, Larry? Do you think it'll be mayhem when we do have one in terms of uh, how it gets uh, distributed and, and who gets it first? 
Well, well, it's going to be critically important in terms of you know prioritizing and. You know, there's a lot of discussions. We're participating in those discussions with the administration in terms of exactly how we do that. And most important, you know, how are those immunizations provided for? Wolf, I'm going to take us back. I think it's probably 11 or 12 years. And, you know, many of us remember H1N1. And how were we going to provide, you know, that vaccination to millions of Americans across the country? And, you know, pharmacies became the solution. The regulations were changed at that point in time. You know, in today, many people think about their seasonal flu vaccine being administered, you know, by their local pharmacist. So, you know, we are ready. We see ourselves as being an important part of that solution when the vaccine becomes available. Yeah, I think the prioritization is obviously going to be key. Larry, just finally wanted to get your thoughts on the political situation. President Trump uh, just laid out an executive order with a number of items meant to address high drug prices in this country, wondering if any of that affects you and, and how a Trump administration would be different than a Biden administration as far as your insurance business and, and drug business. Well, Sarah, first, first of all, uh, there's a, a lot of dialogue around what is commonly referred to as the rebate role. And, you know, from our perspective, you know, we talked about this last year. Uh, the data hasn't changed. And as a result, the facts haven't changed. And, you know, those rebates that PBMs do a great job in terms of negotiating with pharmaceutical manufacturers, more than 99% of those get back, they get passed back to the plan sponsor, in this case, the government. And the government utilizes those dollars to reduce the monthly premium for, you know, our seniors that are enrolled in Medicare Part D drug plans. And government actuaries have said that, you know, absent that ability, you know, premiums will go up for seniors on average about 25 percent. So that rebate rule does not solve the issue of drug prices. And, you know, what needs to be done is point to what really drives drug prices. And that's the list price that's set by, you know, manufacturers. You know, Sarah, your, your second question in terms of, you know, the future, if you will, and the impact that politics may have on that, I don't think any of us have a crystal ball right now. You know, what I think we can say is that the role of the private sector has demonstrated its value time after time after time. Look at what we've done during the pandemic. And, and as you look at, you know, other government programs like Medicare Advantage or the Medicare Part D drug program that, you know, we were talking about, you know, handing off those programs to the private sector where competition, you know, and innovation made good things happen. I don't see that dynamic changing. Yeah, well, we, we need the drugs right now and the innovation, certainly. Larry Merlot, thank you for joining us.